So when uh, everyone has had a chance to join us uh, for af this afternoon's uh, lecture by Yannis Haji Nicolaou, uh, I would like to welcome everyone um, uh, for this event, which is uh, an event that uh, is in line with the long series of activities that the Humanities Research Fellowship Program has organized over the five, six years, last five or six years. And uh, I will start with uh, giving you a short uh, introduction to Janus' uh, activities, uh, research and activities, and then hand the floor to him. Janus uh, Hachi Nicolaou studied history and art history and Southeast Asian art history at the universities of Berlin and Amsterdam, uh, where he got his MA in 2010. In the following years, he had uh, two fel research fellowships um, with two larger research um, collaboratives, um, both in Berlin. One was called Collegium for the Advanced Study of Picture Act and Embodiment, and the other one was called Cluster of Excellence, Image Knowledge, Gestaltung and Interdisciplinary Laboratory. And I would like to highlight the word Picture Act. Uh, Janis was, uh, uh, did his research, uh, particularly under Horst Bledekam, who is one of the leading art historians in Europe, who uh, really made a turn or uh, initiated a turn in, in, in art history, especially in Europe, less so in the United States, um, where uh, the artwork is considered to be an actor, an agent or an actor. And this, this agency can consist, can be symbolical, can be social, can be aesthetic, emotional, metaphysical, intellectual. And Janus worked in that environment very proficiently. He defended his uh, <coughs> PhD thesis in 2014 at the Free University of Berlin. Uh, uh, his dissertation was then published in German and then later in 2019, there was a, a, a revised and extended uh, English um, translation called Thinking Bodies, Shaping Hands, Handling, which means something like the, the hands that are acting in art and theory of the late Rembrandtists, that is the followers of Rembrandt. In the following years, uh, from 2014 to 17, um, he was research associate of a project called Symbolic Articulation, Language and Image Between Action and Scheme. Here you hear the same word, action, uh, again at the, uh, this time at the Humboldt University in Berlin. And in 2015, 16, and 17, he taught, uh, gave several courses at universities of Hamburg and in Basel in Switzerland. Then from 2017 to 20, he was PI together with uh, two other people of a scientific network called Synagogism and the Visual Arts, which again was funded by the German uh, Research Foundation. And in 2017 and 18, uh, Janus came to us for the first time as a fellow in the Research Fellowship Program uh, during a time, and at this time he organized a very successful conference, which was also published. And then in 2018, he started a, uh, a long-term research associateship with another large uh, research network in Germany um, that is called, again, I have to mention the German term first, Bilderfahrzeuge, image vehicles, uh, A.B. Warburg's legacy and the future of iconology. Uh, in that capacity, he is working now at the University of Hamburg. Janus has published a lot of things, uh, several books, uh, articles, many articles, and he has uh, edited uh, several volumes. So he's a very prolific uh, researcher and we are extremely happy uh, that we have him today with us, uh, where he will talk about wandering falcons, wandering images, falconry as diplomatic image vehicle. So please, Janus, the floor is yours. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Randat, uh, for your introduction. And thank you also, Alex and Randat, for the organization as well as invitation. Um, it goes without saying that I would have preferred to be with um, in Abu Dhabi for the persons that are there. Um, and at least the virtual background evokes um, this very thing. Let me um, immediately start with by sharing um, the screen with you. I hope that you can um, see my screen. <coughs> 
an image that went viral to stick to the jargon of our present shows hooded falcons inside an airplane being placed together with human passengers traveling somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula, if we judge from the garments worn by the majority of the people in the cabin. Those hooded passengers put into a mobile cargo are about to fly, this time not by themselves. They are as valuable as a human life, not only because they share the same space with humans, and a Falcon ticket can sometimes even be more expensive than that of a human, but also because they have an identity. This is the reason why they were given passports. The horse or the ship of pre-modern times are substituted by another means of transportation for crossing the desert in high speed, since the approximately 80 falcons were taken to Jeddah accompanying a Saudi prince. These truly polyvalent animalia are visual agents and emblems of political power, as well as identity markers of the former Bedouins. In an issue of Nature from March 2021, an article on the flight of the falcon involved a different kind of human-animal interaction. Researchers have placed a camera with sensors on the fastest animal on Earth, the peregrine falcon, up to 320 kilometers per hour, in order to track its movement regarding environmental change memory and genetics that shape the bird's migration, as you can read from the title. 56 peregrines were used in over 150 migration routes. As the visualized data revealed, these animals move across several continents following six main routes that are constantly transformed according to climate change. The Falcon vehicle being also itself a high resolution low-tech camera and carrying a further high-tech one on its body is an implicit political vehicle helping scientists to understand environmental change and global warming. In the following, I would like to approach the history of falconry from both a material and a visual culture perspective from studying the migration of animals and that of objects and images. Falconry, one might say, is material and visual culture on the moon. Falconry images may well be construed as image vehicles, literally and metaphorically. Just as the art of falconry arriving in the West, meaning the European continent, more or less from the East, traveled widely in time and space, so did the image vehicles forging, for instance, political alliances on their way. In this sense, not only the birds of prey themselves, but also falconry images and falconry decoy are image vehicles that combine medium with subject, form with content. Falcon and image are intertwining entities, since both have an agency beyond the mere control of their maker or handler. This is a challenge for every form of political representation. Falconry became a universal practice of sovereignty, one promoted and practiced through naturalia and artificialia in the merging of nature and culture, as the case of falconry paradigmatically is. Abi Warburg, the art historian who coined the term image vehicle at the beginning of the 20th century, explicitly linked prints to birds flying back and forth between Southern and Northern Europe. Falcons wander around as images do. We will though widen our perspective beyond Europe and we'll look at flying back and forth between the East and the West, a subject which goes together with falconry's transcultural power. The interactions between East and West, but also North and South are a kind of basic presupposition in order to understand the mobility of the phenomenon even if, or exactly because, the traces between import and export cannot be really distinguished. This spatial dynamic gains a visual dimension through artifacts on the move, beyond real hawks and the falconers that move in different spatial configurations. 
In this way, narratives of clear-cut movements or identities concerning the origins of the practice that some people try to pursue due to national or even nationalistic convictions become unimportant. The falcon has a force that used to be related to the images and their materiality, all the more so when the bird of prey became an image itself. The boundaries of image circulation are not fixed and have an analogous power to the hawk's untamed nature that cannot be framed. Falconry itself as an image practice is a non-verbal communication between human and animal as the image in our relationship to it also is. Animation was a core component of the image's agency, a force moving aggressively in Vabok's phrase toward the beholder, like a falcon stooping down on its prey. I will trace this peculiar kind of living naturalia in political interaction and their respective visual power from six different asymmetrical perspectives. Number one, falconry as visual diplomacy. The physical movement of crafted objects and the falcons themselves as diplomatic cargoes connected and still connect countries and continents. A print by Echidius Schadler dated 1605 is such a case. It bears inscriptions in Farsi and Latin. The Persian ambassador of Shah Abbas, Mehdi Kulipech, is depicted ad vivum, as the inscription tells us, meaning from life, visiting the court of Rudolf II in Prague and carrying a hawk, possibly as a gift and simultaneously as extension of his own second nature, substituting his sovereign. The goshawk wearing a jangoli, a strap looped around her neck, used almost exclusively in the East to lower a hawk's head for aerodynamic reasons before casting her directly at quarry, functions on the one hand as a symbol of the Orient and on the other as a means to initiate mutual diplomatic relations. However, the animal is not introduced as something entirely foreign in contradistinction to the turban of the man with the elaborated feathers, since the technique of falconry was commonly shared in Habsburgian Prague as in Persian Isfahan, even if with different cultural expressions. The ambassador carrying the hawk speaks not only for the movable medium of images printed on paper, but also for the content depicted in such images, which was meant for an international audience, not only a Persian or a Habsburgian one. It is, in other words, a transcultural image in motion. Forged through the art of falconry, the two empires' relations and their alliance against the Ottoman Empire were visually conveyed. The print encapsulates the hawk's aggressive and obedient nature, underlining the seriousness, but also the fragility of the possible alliance. It is in matters of medium and content, a paradigmatic case of visual diplomacy. The success of the print underlines a less known version in color from the hand of Dirk Jansson van Schampen, the specific image was part of a Dutch advocate's collection who arranged printed portraits according to a socio-political hierarchy, including images of popes and kings. Kulibek had his place among other Islamic personalities preceding Cosimo I of Florence and therefore questioning certain hierarchical visual structures inside the European album. His cloak appears in the colored version more accentuated with stitched human figures on it. From a visual vantage point, there is a meta level of diplomacy that is formed in the ambassador's cloak. Impressive is here not only the typical ornaments and human figures on the cloth, but also the haptic qualities of the silk and hence the material itself. And I just show you uh, next to that a portrait of another um, Persian ambassador by an English painter, just to, for you to look at the cloak and to compare it with the one by Kuli Bech. As it is known, similar cloths were used as diplomatic 
pouch. These were indeed political cargoes. An example shows in verso and recto two groups of Persian courtiers holding falcons or vessels. And I show you a Mughal miniature of a Turkish ambassador holding exactly a, a similar pouch, just to give you an idea how this might look have liked. The protection of an ambassador's cloak is analogous to the falcon that he is carrying. In other words, there is a doubleness of subject and medium carrying the former. They constitute a powerful entity engaging the diplomatic encounter on a simultaneous material contextual level. This truly is a material and sensorial political iconology in motion. Even to this day, sovereigns and prime ministers present falcons either alive or in the form of artifacts to other heads of state. And this is just a, a picture a couple of years ago uh, of the South Korean prime minister and his visit to the UAE. A 2010 gift from the UAE interior minister, his German counterpart, identifies the falcon as the symbol of the United Arab Emirates. Since the foundation of the UAE in 1971, the falcon has been used as a symbol of Bedouin society and unity. This local and artisanal artifact, although a tradition of similar objects never existed in the respective region, carries on its base the UAE Armed Forces Code of Arms, I hope you can see that, as an image within an image. In other words, the protection of the interior is represented in the exterior through the glocal image of the falcon. Exchanging and trading falcons, a highly lucrative business due largely to falconry's popularity, was already practiced during the global pre-modernity. Establishing diplomacy with living natural specimens has been a highly effective way of forging mutual diplomatic relations, since one did not offer dead luxuries like diamonds, but living animals having their own will with which one had to interact with in order to establish his or her own sovereignty in the presence of the other party. In this sense, the respective relationship with those wild creatures was much more intriguing and certainly more complicated. Number two, falconry and political sensuality. Falcons incarnated claims of power and sovereignty, connections and alliances, but they could also be the cause of disputes or even war. This fact is paradigmatically embodied in the hawk's peculiar nature that united aggressive with peaceful elements. And I show you here um, uh, two emblems from Europe, the one above on Cura Publica, the Commonwealth, with the falconer representing this, and below an allusion to fight. And exactly both spheres are also to be found in the Indian subcontinent on the one hand with Chan Bibi, the Muslim uh, princess who fight it also against the Mughals and on a battle scene where a falcon is triumphing upon the hare. This double connotation has always been an integral part of falconry's nature and culture. Falcons, and falconry were not simply passive elements of mere political representation, but their exchange and even more importantly, their formative role constituted spheres of diplomacy. In other words, the symbolic dimension of falconry is unfolded upon a very concrete and tangible basis. These two constitutive elements are distinguished by dynamic relations in terms of constant processes analogous to human-animal interactions. In the present endeavor, a political and material iconology is targeted, trying to raise awareness of what the historian Reinhard Kozelek called political sensuality. The second part of the term was in reality less put into focus, although Kozelek was deeply interested in images. Those two elements were often played against each other. That is, generally speaking, content was often regarded as more crucial than its 
sensual form and materiality. In some, falcon gifts are not only agents of political and cultural manifestations as spaces of transcultural encounters, but largely constitute those very relations. They are material vehicles of political exchange. Animal gifts reflected functional as well as representational purposes inside a single court, as well as between sovereigns from different ones. There was a particular interest in falcons, which were special in terms of rarity, plumage, colors, and origin, and had therefore a considerable value, not exclusively measured in financial terms, since value was often translated in other forms of reciprocity, such as alliances. In addition to this, the aesthetic dimensions of both falcons and the performative art of falconry were of paramount importance. The achievement of a diplomatic goal was accomplished through a particular medium, a kind of package of the respective mission or embassy. However, the gift was not only the package, it could be even be the content itself, or it had at least an implicit relation to it. The medium was indeed the message encapsulated in the form of the hawk's contradictory behavioral mode. The independent agency of images and things similar to the falcons themselves play their own, sometimes even subversive kind of game. Number three, falcons as gifts. Falconry was an interface constituting a space for negotiation between sovereigns or other agents, motivating them through a common passion to talk about prospective plans, even if or exactly because both parties were meeting for the first time. Birds of prey were ideal triggers to pursue further relations if everything went accordingly. The commonly shared yet simultaneously diverse, culturally speaking, technique of falconry involved and still involves an empathetic distance, reinforcing diplomatic interactions. The gift not only brings forth dependencies, but also obligations and conserves or reinforces power relations between different agents. This obligation remains as long as the debt is not returned. In some cases, the non-returnable nature of the debt can be proven to be more powerful than its cancellation. Marcel Moss, in his classic study, The Gift, defined the obligation to give, to conserve, and to react or to reply as fundamental aspects of gift offering. This is the basis for any kind of debt constellation, since every gift is connected to the burden of a rejoinder especially when a debt is intrinsically bound to a political order. According to Moss, the gift constitutes the reciprocal counter gift, whether it is of a material or other kind of nature. Moreover, gift exchanges also offer opportunities for transcultural exchanges. These do not simply move in a linear way from A to B and back, but rather demand a permanent interaction in which the goal of appropriation is not always given or visible. It is as if um, in that way, the falconers would merely instrumentalize the bird of prey as if she were a passive object. However, as an idiosyncratic organic agent, following her only her own interests, this anarchic animal elevates the gift to a sort of an active counterpart with which one has also to form a certain diplomatic relationship. The sovereign's political wisdom is measured in the acknowledgement of the other non-human party without trying to subjugate her, but rather to cooperate in a non-verbal way in order to achieve the respective goals. This eventually successful interaction with the untainable animal would prove that a sovereign is also capable of cooperating with humans. There is, however, another dimension. To give a falcon as a gift means to simultaneously acknowledge the sovereignty of the other party. 
through the paradigmatic substitution between sovereign and falcon acting as his or her extended avatar, the, the issue of paying tribute or even obedience and simultaneously signaling warning are incarnated in the falcon. In that way, the animal becomes a vehicle of a visual and nonverbal diplomacy, like in Sadler's print. The maintenance of the, of the reason of state is, symbolically speaking, secured through the diplomatic employment of falconry. Number four, falcons as natural artworks. Falcon gifts were also employed in order to secure certain conditions for territorial claims or favors, such as in the case of uh, Charles V, who bequeathed the island of Malta to the Knights Hospitaller under the condition that they would send him as a remembrance a jeer falcon every year. The Habsburg even helped the King of Tunisia to regain his throne in exchange for which the ruler had to send him six falcons every year. This shows the ritualization and substitutional relation between territory and falcon. The search for falcons and the respective thirst for collecting reinforced the trophy. Oh, I cannot move to the next image now. Okay, the search for falcons and the respective thirst for collecting reinforced the trophy-like character of falconry. Falcons were in that sense natural, self-mobile artworks. Again, from a collecting point of view, hawks and images have a further form of relation. Some human agents involved in the practice of falconry also wanted to possess a transcultural and insofar as uh, possible complete collection of different falcons that would permit them to show off as collectors by uniting all kinds of different animal properties almost in an encyclopedic manner. And here, uh, this image attributed to Archimboldo with a Norwegian gear falcon belonging to Alfonso d'Este of Ferrara, um, and below you see this also beautifully rendered image of this bird of paradise with its reds, yellows, and tiny greens. This passion for collectionism went so far that kings were kept for ransom. Alliances were only made with the goal that a sovereign could acquire a hawk that did not originate from one's own country. But there is also another dimension in this issue brilliantly illustrated in a ninth century letter of the Caliph's secretary, Al-Mutavakil, who was the 10th Caliph of the Abbasids. One reads the following striking testimony, and I quote, most excellent king whose forefathers were falconers of the very highest distinction. You have adorned my neck with jewels beyond price. Adorn now my hand with a falcon, Honor me with a bird of translucent wings whose plumage has been smoothed by the northern winds. End of quote. The caliph's powerful heritage becomes clear not only in political, but also in falconry terms. Both aspects are hence exposed as interwoven elements, since his ancestors are defined as falconers, and we are in the ninth century. The highest reward for the secretary is to ask the caliph to give him a falcon as a gift, and especially one from the north, meaning a jeer falcon. In this way, the secretary can also have a connection to the very heritage of his own master. Relations are established here within one and the same court, and not even between equals, since these are forged within a clear-cut social hierarchy. In an entirely different part of the world, within the huge Chinese Imperium during the Tang Dynasty in the ninth century, it is documented how 12 falcons were sent from an imperial legate in Shantong to Xiangchang, but they were returned 
This gesture of not accepting the gift, also an essential part of gift exchanging, should reveal the sovereign's incorruptibility, even if, or exactly because, it was known that the ruler passionately pursued falconry and other forms of hunting. This counterexample simultaneously proves the validity of the commonplace that falcon gifts are employed for diplomatic reasons around the globe. Number five, falconry as a vehicle of dynastic continuity. A miniature adds a further perspective to the overall subject. It is dated around 1630-40, underlining falconry as a vehicle of dynastic continuity and legitimacy of power. Emperor Akbar appears in the middle, whereas he has turned his back to his son and falconry lover Jahangir, who also handles a falcon. Shah Jahan will soon receive a bird of prey, see his outstretched hands. Through this material symbolic act, he becomes a legitimate successor of the throne. Like images of Pope nephews in Europe, the legacy of the successor's line is visually captured through the eldest son, Darashiko, who stands next to his father but is not placed on the throne. Two Mughal ministers accompany the event below like saints of a sacra conversazione, elevating the image into a political conversazione. Borrowing from anthropologist Clifford Geertz, we might construe the global art of falconry as a performative state practice, a theater state in full motion. Another historical pair of diplomatic interaction, similar to that between Persians and the Habsburgs, is here between Safavids and Mughals, with Shah Abbas and Jahangir as their protagonists. Both sovereigns, as it is visualized in a number of miniatures or verbalized in autobiographies and other sources, were passionate falconers employing this technique and their respective images concerning their own political legitimation. On the left, you see Shah Jahan, and on the right, Shah Abbas. Jahangir describes in his memoirs how he received the falcon from his ambassador in Persia, Khan Alam, and I quote, I viewed a white falcon raised in the wild that Khan Alam, who had gone as an ambassador to Iran, had sent as a gift, end of, of quote. What is important is to keep here in mind that a white falcon is almost certainly a jeer falcon. Jeer falcons were the most precious of their royal falcon gifts. Originally from Greenland or Iceland, they belong to the most sought after category of falcons, and not just in Northern Europe, since they were used for encounters of sovereigns throughout Eurasia. Number six and last point, falconry as political image vehicle. The Persian Mughal diplomatic dialogues with falconry as their political cargo are encapsulated in a miniature, probably from the hand of Abu al Hasan, showing Jahangir and Shah Abbas on an elevated throne. Like in Sadler's case, the visit of a Persian is visually captured from the other side, namely from that where the visit is paid to. Although both sovereigns sit on the same height, Jahangir is clearly the true ruler in the scene, placed in a more upright position than the somewhat stooping Shah Abbas, who appears smaller in comparison to the mighty Mughal. Jahangir has stretched his left hand as a sign of goodwill. Two Mughal ambassadors, among them the just mentioned Khan Alam, are shown below as worldly messengers. They hold diverse objects in their hands, especially those by Khan Alam, including a falcon resting upright on his glove, are of interest here. Asaf Khan, the advisor of Jahangir and his brother-in-law, is looking towards the Persian sovereign carrying wine utensils. Beneath the two ambassadors, several fruits and sweets ornament the scene as if they would be in front of an altar as part of the earthy world, whereas above the European element of the Puti forms part of the supernatural meeting. 
the offered objects derived from different cultural settings. They are Italian, like the white ewer and the two large vessels on the table, or the Venetian transparent wine glass, whereas the small teacup seems to be Chinese. Two Portuguese liturgical objects frame the scene, whereas the fruits are placed on Japanese lacquer. Jessica Keating believes that the gold cup, the saucer, and vessel held by Asaf Khan look as if they were crafted in Persia. In other words, the presentation of global objects is encapsulated in the presence of falconry as a transcultural technique. These elements are material traces and visual testimonies of the ruler's imaginary encounter, notably during a time of crisis in their relations concerning territorial claims. In this way, several sensorial dimensions are put in front of our eyes and bodies, involving not only seeing, but also touching and tasting. Accordingly, this imaginary political conversation, since a meeting never took place in reality, is multi-sensorial. The miniature is framed by stunning colors of different flowers presented as an enclosed garden of the sea. These dazzling colors are also found on the human's garments and the whole principle seen, and they evoke the sense of smell as well. Khan Alam was not only an ambassador of Jahangir to the Safavid court, but also his falconer, bringing those two dimensions in direct association to one another, encapsulated in one and the same person. Falconry is crafted here as an essential agent concerning diplomacy underlined through the diplomat falconer. But to conclude, there is a more as one more aspect to the story. Khan Alam is shown on the side of Shah Abbas because he led the embassy to Persia, holding on his other hand an artifact showing a woman on a deer. The brown courty of Alam acts as a canvas of the object. The art historian immediately thinks of Diana. The golden appearance of the object reminds one simultaneously of the Augsburg School of Artists, such as Joachim Fries, and I'll show you here an example. It is an image vehicle that arrived in the Indian subcontinent from Europe, possibly as a gift from Persia. The Ottomans received such objects from the Habsburgs that probably gave this one to the Persians concerning the prospect of an alliance, but this is only a hypothesis. The object is a drinking game automaton, bringing two dimensions of pleasure together. Drinking, as well as hunting, involve further sensorial dimensions concerning perception and function. The potentiality of movement is also inherent to the object. Jesuits or merchants brought similar automata to model India. Falconry is in this case part of a living wonder of cabinets. Another important point is the manner of miniature moving in the Indian subcontinent, somewhere between Persia and Europe, creating something else, Muggle painting, where the question of appropriation should not be understood solely in matters of hybridity, but similar to the objects presented in the sense of an international style. And I'm thinking here, especially of Kavita Singh's important contribution to that matter. There is a combination of falconry as a trophy, underlined through the falcon as natural form, contrasted to the artificial form of the automaton, both being agents of the respective diplomacy between the two men united in the miniature. But there is also another, more abstract dimension that combines those naturalia with the artificialia, or the merging of nature with culture in general, because both objects are related to movement. The falcon, which is a gear falcon, an import, and hence the white falcon that Jahangir reflects in his memoirs, can fly and move in a most natural way, in literal bella figura, in opposition to the artificial movement of the automaton. Both the falcon and the automaton are also being moved through agents or in interaction with them. They are wandering sensorial objects in time and space, addressing simultaneously tactility and vision, two crucial faculties of image perception and falconry.
see the hands of Khan Alam. Falconry, hunting in general, art, as well as food and wine, constitute a space of interaction and negotiation where the sovereigns can connect and empathize with one another, even if they never met in real. Here, it is the agency of the image and the objects depicted that make such a projection possible. The image itself is non-verbal diplomacy, a visual imaginative space of interaction, a political image vehicle par excellence. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Yanis, for this uh, very interesting survey of different aspects of the image vehicle, which uh, I can imagine may invite questions among the audience. Uh, uh, what exactly, or the whole variety of meanings that this term could cover. Uh, I invite everyone to ask questions in the Q&A section of the screen. Um, and if you um, allow me, I would like to begin perhaps the Q&A with a question of my own. Um, <clears throat> uh, in, in the first part of your presentation, um, you talk about, if I understand correctly, the, the falcon as an image. And that is to say, the living bird as an image. And then you give, <clears throat> sorry, an, uh, an example of um, the Ministry of Inner in a, a defense, I think, of the UAE, where you see a sculpture, if you will, silver, or a sculpture, if you can call it that way, um, an image of a falcon. So you could say an image of an image. I don't want to make it uh, too, uh, too wordy. Um, and then, of course, you have images, um, like the one that we saw on our screen, on our flat screen, of that very sculpture, which in itself is an image of a falcon. So you, I think you're seeing where I'm getting here. Is there, is there, a, is there a difference, if you will, will in in the power of the image agency? Is uh, there a difference in that power um, relative to the medium in which this image exists? And of course, you, one cannot say say this phrase when it regards a real falcon. But you have a real falcon. You have a sculpture of a falcon. You have an image of a falcon on a flat screen. And I raise this question because nowadays we are so accustomed to look at this machine for almost two years now, almost exclusively, that um, we may have lost the sense of the real world, that the images that we see on, the, uh, on this screen, even if they move like I do my hands, um, that they are only a flat, literally and figuratively image of the real thing. So my question is, if you, from seen from the point of view of agency and the power of agency, the effectiveness, the, the, the level of impact of imagery, would you say one should make a distinction between the falcon as this living image, a sculpture of that living image, or something like a flat or an engraving of an, uh, that we have seen, or an etching, or even a, an, an image on the screen. How would you, how do you look at this? Yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Thank you, Reinhard. This is a very important question, um, which goes, if you like, to the mediality or the materiality of this phenomenon. Um, of course, um, art history, um, is, um, is um, practically a discipline that from its beginning relied uh, upon uh, reproductive images, uh, instruments that made those reproduction possible. And of course, if we trace that, this is a highly interesting phenomenon, starting that, let's say, around 1900s, uh, where uh, those uh, the opticons and and later the apparatuses of of the of the the dias, the slides of projections now to PowerPoint and and the Zoom. How do those things um, affect the way um, not only uh, <coughs> how we react to those images, but especially when working with them? 
how do they play a, a highly important role, agency, uh, uh, in our formation, uh, interpretation, um, as well as evaluation of this whole material. And I would definitely say that there is there a, a, high, a, a high impact. And if you look, of course, from art historians, from, from Abi Vabok, Erwin Panofsky, who um, uh, from his memory uh, wrote a whole book on the Netherlands painting without paying attention to the fact <coughs> of color, as he said um, to his students, he preferred to go with his sunglasses through the, the uh, different museums to watch those uh, images. Of course, there is a highly impact. There is an aura, if you like. In this sense, I would say that the reproduction of aura is not destroyed, as Walter Benjamin would have said, um, in connection uh, to uh, the work of art, but is actually enhanced. But of course, um, this agency have been happening on two-dimensional flat surfaces, um, of course, cannot be uh, looked solely as that. We need uh, the haptic. We need uh, the different aspects of, of a sculpture. If it is out of stone or wood, it makes a huge different impact, uh, not to mention uh, oil painting and all of that. So we need the haptics. We need the work of art in itself and to look at it at museums. So of course, I think everyone is happy now that museums again opened. We need this presence, um, but and simultaneously, of course, through the technological employment and the technological devices, um, we are dependent on certain things of uh, getting, let's say, through the Go Google Art project, certain dimensions that we would never get um, uh, at the museum and at the thing itself. And yeah. let's say to, to not, because this is a, a huge question and to make, to make not to, to, let's say, elaborate too much on that, one could exactly say the same things um, concerning the falcons, the falconry images um, uh, themselves, as you can, practically develop that in, in many different subjects and art forms. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, just a, a brief comment. Uh, nowadays, uh, you have this whole development in contemporary art, uh, making NFTs as artworks. Yes. yes. And that raises a whole other dimension of the relationship between say NFTs, let's say of images of falcons and how they relate to uh, real falcons, but I will leave this uh, not, this is not a question more, a, a footnote remark. I would like to read to you a question that Annika Lenson has presented to us, a very highly interesting question. And I just allow me to read uh, her question. She thanks you for a fascinating talk. And she says, it's quite compelling to think of the falcon as an image vehicle. <clears throat> In addition to tracking falcon as a bundle of characteristics, kinetic and so, mobile and, uh, and so forth, she wonders, if she can ask you uh, your thoughts on the falcon as what seems, as she, as she says, to judge by the historical representations in, in your talk, a changing natural entity. That is to say, different species appear. Each painted falcon representation uh, uh, differs rather dramatically, as we have seen. How should one think about this? Uh, an investment in demonstrating that the depicted falcons originate not from one's own country, in parallel, uh, did the species of the falcon change in appearance and history, either due to climate change or differences in breeding or other? So there's this natural uh, aspect uh, uh, mm. and, and, and the culture of, of breeding in, in it's an important uh, part. In other words, she says, how stable is the animal of the falcon in the very long and entangled history you are tracking? And, and she says, in other words, She'd like to see if uh, you are interested in what she mentions as the recent echo art history approach that tracks climate change as another actor um, and other kinds of human nature shifts. So it's a 
ecological nature art related question. Thank you, Annika. So please, Janis. Yes, thank you. This is also a, a very big and very important question um, that uh, indeed interests me uh, as well. And um, you can see that beautifully, actually, especially um, in the 20th century, um, where actually breeding started, let's say, to be taken out from the wild in the cultural domestic interior, let's say. So we can also, of course, see how much culture and nature are actually uh, highly embedded with one another. And if one sees, of course, what um, today is happening with the crossover of DNA, of Falcon, Falcon's DNA embodied in one and the same bird with different faculties that are connected to do, let's say, the, the super bird, yeah, the super, <laughs> um, in, in this kind of sense, um, actor, then, of course, this question uh, takes up a very um, important take. And of course, one could also think, for, for example, um, exactly on this term of natural and cultural, uh, of the polar ex ex expedition of the national socialists with Goering, who wanted to import uh, deer falcons from, uh, from uh, Iceland, as we saw um, a number of cases, to Germany as let's say the pure, the white Aryan race falcons. And um, he had a, a great falconer with him who was at the same time a very problematic figure in political terms, um, who helped him with that. Um, but, and he was also a painter. So you can see again how the painter falconer uh, emerges here. Uh, and this person, I have a, a small chapter actually on that in, 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 for, for my book. Um, you can see there how um, this whole expedition um, is actually does not is not successful because those falcons. We are not yet in this DNA time of crossovering and, and, and breeding. Those falcons die in Germany, and in that sense. This whole vision of um, of having those racial pure animals uh, was actually accompanied with a, not a success. This is just to say, to give you two examples um, that goes um, in this direction of this um, very important uh, question. Thank you again. Um. I myself, if you allow me, have, have another question that relates to this subversive element that you mentioned, uh, let's say in the diplomatic uh, traffic. Uh, if, uh, as you have seen, this, this, this habit of uh, giving a falcon uh, as a sign to um, a head of state, or let's say the head of state of an important uh, position in another state, which, uh, if I understand you correctly, is something that happened uh, is almost a thousand years. Um, could that also, uh, on the one hand, you put the emphasis on, let's say, the collectible elements. Uh, you, you speak of falcons as a, as a work of art. You bring to mind the whole cabinets of curiosities, uh, uh, fashion in a way, um, where falcons uh, avidly are being um, sampled and collected um, in order to enhance the collection of the, of the ruler. Now, if you, but you also mentioned the subversive element of the of, of giving giving a falcon to another head of state, and that of course, or at least that's a question on my part. Does that relate to the the double nature of the falcon, who, on the one hand, is the symbol of power over the the, the bird that the falcon will prey on, but at the same time, the ruler or the falconer is, if you will, in control of at least to a large degree not absolute control, but to control of, uh, of the falcon. And in, from that point of view, seen from that point of view, the falcon is very much, um, let's say, under, under the rule, under the rulership of the sovereign. So could the handing of a falcon by one head of state to the other actually could be a rather, let's say, dubious or double entendre gift 
could it be a double entendre gift expressing not only the, the, the eagerness of the other ruler to collect a falcon, but basically uh, be a message, I'm control, I'm in control of you. Do mm. I exaggerate here or? This is, I, I can only underline this with a, with a red marker. Um, and I could practically only add something to this uh, point um, that is, of course, um, having uh, many cases of children uh, handling falcons, um, sovereigns, both women and men, Mary of Burgundy and Charles V. That is in the uh, idea of uh, the first Erziehung by er Erasmus, this Erasmian idea of the pedagogical tool um, of, of a so sovereign concerned with falconry, that a sovereign should be accustomed with this sub subversive nature of the animal that brings up many, many exactly he or she is being shaped, so to speak, by this force. Um, and this has an allusion um, to, to true life, to, to true questioning of representation and, and alluding also to governmental things that is going on together with uh, diplomatic encounters. And funny enough, there is this kind of connection um, in, in the Netherlands, the 17th century, where you have many, many, many portraits, group portraits of children that practically overtake the stake in this kind of as if aristocratic habitus that is transformed into a more, if you like, uh, patrician or commoner-like uh, thing connected to the question of handling businesses. And of course, the risk taking, um, the tulipomania crisis <laughs> have, uh, and, and other economic dis disasters or, 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 or uh, in 1720 um, shows this, brings up the falcon as a kind of metaphor of, of um, getting to know one's own, but getting to know the the uh, interactive nature that comes against you uh, in order to be able to handle it. You cannot possess it, so to speak, but you must know how to handle it. Yeah. So yes, I would definitely say that this is a, a nucleus um, concerning the specific yeah. uh, question yeah. that I mentioned. Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, uh, um, Janis. I was, uh, um, I, I'm afraid that we don't have too much time for other questions uh, anymore. I just would like to refer to um, uh, an image that I've been told uh, is very, very visit in the eyes of pilots when they fly over the new airport in Abu Dhabi. Uh, because apparently the entire design of the airport, uh, if you look at it from, a, from above, is designed as a falcon. Yeah. Um, so that shows you the importance, uh, the huge importance of this, uh, of the animal, animal of the figure, and actually of the power of the agency that this image has uh, in the Arab world, but also um, basically. And you've showed us chi uh, examples from China, from from India, from from Europe. Um, so truly, uh, this is a, a topic that. Uh, I would dare say is really global. Uh, you, you, I think you, you, you give an example of, uh, if you will, of global art history. So I do want to thank you on behalf of everyone attending um, the presentation and wish everyone a good day. Thank you also from our side and for the questions and the event.